Are you tired of all that noise created when shooting in low light? What about unwanted distortions? Well, Canon's found a way to improve their image sensors to reduce noise and other imperfections. But will we see this in the Canon EOS R5 Mark II due out at the end of May or in the Canon EOS R1? Well, in Canon patent filing JP 2024 048578 filed on September the 28th, 2022 and published April the 9th, 2024, Canon claims to provide a photoelectric conversion device having an avalanche photodiode and capable of suppressing image quality deterioration. So the essence of this patent application is that Canon's found a way to improve their image sensors that we would find in high-end cameras, such as the Canon EOS R5 and the Canon EOS R1, to improve low light performance and reduce distortions. But how? Let's take a look at the photoelectric conversion apparatus or device. It's made up from several components. The photoelectric conversion element houses avalanche photodiodes. This is designed to convert optical images or your photos into electric signals. The image or photo generation unit produces the initial image based on the signal captured by the photoelectric conversion element. Then the acquisition unit is responsible for gathering initial characteristics or information about the photoelectric conversion element. This information is then utilized by a correction processing unit which applies initial correction processing to the image as you can see here. And this is done within the correction processing unit. The weighting of this initial correction processing adjusts dynamically based on the pixel signal's intensity within the first image, with further corrections being done by the time we get to the third image. Simply put, what the patent application is attempting to resolve here, or I would say more or less improve, is how the image sensor captures your photo, your images. During that capture process, there's a tendency that, especially in low light situations, we can create noise, but there's also a chance of creating distortions. So this patent application aims to solve that through a process known as, are you ready for this? Avalanche photodiodes. So how exactly does that work? Well, through about four steps here, I'm gonna to try to break that down into simple terms. You ready? Okay, let's go. One thing about avalanche photodiodes is they're highly sensitive. But one characteristic of this highly sensitive photodiode is that they may introduce certain imperfections which can affect image quality. And one of the things that the patent application claims to address is uh, solving those imperfections using the avalanche photodiode process. Once we've captured the image using avalanche photodiodes, Canon then applies various corrections to the captured image through the photoelectric conversion unit, known as adaptive correction. And lastly, the patent adjusts the level of correction based on the pixel signal. And this is done in the first image. The data is then sequenced using dynamic adjustments based on the intensity of that pixel signal. So essentially what we're getting out of this patent application are technologies that will improve image quality. That's really the, at the essence of this here. But what's different from other sensors, such as the one found in the Canon EOS R3, which is a stack sensor, is that the corrections are not just applied across the entire sensor, the technology looks at the pixel strength of each signal and then based on this pixel strength will apply to give us the best possible result. And that's good news. Now the obvious next question is, can we expect to see, in this, see this in the Canon EOS R5 Mark II, a camera according to Canon rumors that is supposed to be announced in the last week of May? Or the Canon EOS R1, a camera that we're supposed to get a development announcement, again according to Canon rumors, in the last week of May? And my answer is simply yes. We've seen an awful lot of patent applications that improve the image sensor of Canon cameras, that improve the image sensor in terms of low light performance, dynamic range, ISO response, and speed and throughput. And to me, uh, this is a foregone conclusion that this meets that. I mean, just look at the Canon EOS R3 with its stacked sensor. Significant improvements in speed and accuracy and image quality over the Canon EOS R5, the 1DX Mark III. So yes, I do expect to see these patent technologies or the proposed technologies of this patent application, JP 2024-04-8768, no, 
8578. So I transpose those numbers there. I do expect to see those in the Canon EOS R5 Mark II, the Canon EOS R1, and other future Canon cameras that are coming out that are aimed at the high end. For sensors found in the R100, I'm definitely not. I mean, we're still stuck with a Digic 8 there, Divic processor. And the R50, well, probably not. We're at, at that price point, I don't expect to see it. Now about the R6 Mark III, potentially. The R8 Mark II, maybe not. And it depends on what other cameras come out. No, I don't expect to see an R2, uh, but the R3 Mark II, definitely, that's also another possibility. But now I wanna to talk to you about something completely different. Monday was the first time that I, like many people, got to experience a total solar eclipse. And I didn't have to leave my home. Well, okay, I had to go outside and go into my backyard because obviously I can't see through the ceiling. And this footage here, I shot of the sun using the Canon RF 800mm f11 with a 2 times extender. And I also added a solar filter because I didn't want to destroy my camera. And this was shot two years ago. That's right, two years ago. So how did I get the total solar eclipse then? If I shot this two years ago, where was I? Well, I'll get to all that in just a moment. But you see, yesterday between, I think it was around two o'clock and four o'clock when the eclipse started in my area, it was overcast. In fact, by around 10 o'clock in the morning till five o'clock, it was completely cloudy. And I'm talking thick clouds where you can't even see any hint of an eclipse, nothing. I was so frustrated. And of course, in my area, my son was sent home. All the school sent the kids home. They didn't want to have to deal with the responsibility of a kid looking up into the sun, going blind and then getting sued or something. So they just said, you know what, send them home, let the parents worry about it. And so my son was really excited. He had his solar glasses that they gave to him at school and he was disappointed. And I said, no, Liam, the sky isn't going to clear. However, one thing we will get to notice is how dark it's going to get. So I said, let's go outside. Let's go ahead and shoot that. Bring your glasses because we might get to see a little bit of the sun. And well, we did. So I had him stand close to the house so he could see a partial solar eclipse because for just a few moments, you got to see the outline of the sun. So once I got to post, I grabbed a bunch of footage of Liam looking up at the sun, or at least trying to find it, adding the moon effect in post. And as you can see here, this looks pretty good. It looks pretty authentic. And one thing you get here is a massive view of the sun, a massive view of the so-called moon, which I faked. And I'll explain how I did that in just a moment. The only part where this starts to fall down is in the totality of the eclipse. Normally, when you have the moon totally blocking out the sun, you get to see the corona. But obviously, you don't see that here. It's completely dark. So how did I create this effect? Well, the first thing I did in Final Cut Pro was is I added a shape effect and I brought dropped that down over the image and I matched it to the size of the sun and then I feathered the edges and that was it. And now the sun, because of the filter I was using, made it look a little bit pink. So I adjusted the color wheels to give it a yellow look. So while I am very disappointed to be right under a solar eclipse without having to spend thousands of dollars on hotels in Niagara Falls, to be completely shut out, it was disappointing. But I got to see how dark it was with my son. I mean, I was using the Canon EOS R5 with the 24 to 105 f4. And when we first started out with a cloud cover, it was I was shooting at f13 with 1 60th of a second. And then it went down to f11, f9, f8, 7.1, until I got all the way down to f4, which was the limitation of that lens. But it kept on going because when I looked at the exposure, I got to negative three stops underexposed or three stops underexposed. And that just gives you, gives you an idea of how dark it got. In fact, it felt like about half an hour before dark. It was a strange feeling. And when you looked up and all you could see were the clouds, it was, you know what? One thing it was very similar to, if you've never experienced the totality of an eclipse like this, if you've ever been under a really, really heavy thunderstorm, I'm talking the type that gives you hail where you've got cell after cell and it gets really, really dark and you get that heavy rain. It felt like that. So I, I felt somewhat disappointed and cheated, but we got to see the darkness. And by using that footage that I created a few years ago with the 800 millimeter F11 and creating the effect, at least using a creative license here that they do in movies all the time, I'm at least able to give myself, my family, a memory 
a memory that is, albeit a little bit of a cheat, a little bit of a lie, but, you know, when I look at the photos of my wife, when she was in Niagara Falls yesterday, she was working and she got her phone out and you could see the, 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 the totality of the eclipse and it was just taking up like 1 20th or 1 30th of the frame. It was very, very small. Uh, with the footage that I created, it's actual footage of the sun with sunspots and, you know, it, when I shot this, it was some 45 seconds a couple of years ago. I really didn't have any use for it. It was kind of boring. But now I've got use for that B-roll. And I, you know, I wish I could play the whole thing for you with the audio that I chose, but I don't have a license for broadcasting. With the audio of my son talking about how dark it's getting and looking up at it for the very first time to see this eclipse, it actually worked out quite well. And in a few years, I might even forget that we didn't get to see the totality of the eclipse, the eclipse. And maybe I might even just take it as being a real memory. Interesting. And if you're interested in what I shot with, if you're interested in picking up the gear, I use the Canon RF 800mm f11. That's a fixed aperture f11. Put the two times extender on like I did, and it's an f22. But I was using filters. I don't remember what filters I was using, but that 800mm f11 can be had for $999 and the two times extender can be had for $599. However, you might also want to consider the RF 200 to 800 millimeter at $1899. And if you're interested in buying any of these or any camera bodies, lenses, or accessories from BH, Adorama, and Amazon.com, then please consider using my affiliate links down below these guys right here because I get a small commission back anywhere from 2 to 12%, which goes back to supporting this channel. And a big thanks to everybody that has used my affiliate links in the past. For those of you just watching, for those that you, for those of you that comment, that give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. It all matters. It all provides feedback. It helps feed that YouTube formula and it helps get this channel exposed and it helps provide funding to this channel. And a big thank you to everybody because this channel wouldn't be where it is today. And especially thank you to you for watching right to the end of the video. Thank you so much. Have yourself a great day. And we'll see you again soon.